This is Spencer with the MacGuffin, and today I'm joined by the director of Prince Avalanche, David Gordon Green. Hello. I was thinking about it on my way over. Like, I feel like you should have some nice little an acronym like DAG for David Allen Dag? Greer. Be oh, like yeah. DDG. It's almost like Dance Dance Revolution or something. I, I need a better middle name, I think. Yeah, some, a vowel would something really about. help your stock, I think. Yeah, that would be help. Um, before we get into Prince Avalanche, I have a lot to talk about that. I, I wanted to ask... Uh, an interesting question. What is it like to be a Criterion Edition filmmaker? That seems like that's got to be, I mean, with that, besides winning an Academy Award or something like that, that's got to be a pretty solid sign that you've done something right in your career. Yeah, you know, that, that was right out of the gate. It's all been downhill <laughs> since then. Um, no, but it was pretty awesome because, we're, I mean, obviously it's a very prestigious catalog to be a yeah. part of, but it's just also, it's great to be with a group of people putting together a package of, of something that they're very passionate about and they appreciate what your what your vision is and and a lot of times you'll get caught up in these dvd um you know uh everything from the box design to the added content on it and they're just trying to do something so lame with it um and and then i remember one time i did a movie and i so i then they they, i get the uh, email saying oh here's what the video cover uh proposal is i was like oh that looks not very good at all so let's do let's do another one because i have it in my contract that i have approval over that and they're like oh well we already printed them and I was like, well, how about unprint them because I have it in my contract? <laughs> and they said, uh, well, we're not going to print them again, so either we use the lame one that you don't like or we don't print them. Wow. So then you're just like, and, the, and you're and just looking at, you're looking at people like, are, are you, you guys got to be kidding me. I kind of like, did you call her bluff? Because that would have been really interesting to be like, fine, no no DVD. I know. I, I, I will absolutely do that from now on. But that was at a very vulnerable point in my career where I didn't realize that I could actually do that and stick to my guns a little bit more. Um, I mean, you've had such an interesting career. I mean, your early films feel like such personal, interesting dramas a lot of the time. And then you are one of those interesting filmmakers that seems open to doing popular material. Like, you know, sure. it seems it seems like some people are like, oh, I got to I got to keep my, my uh, morals and my, my uh, beliefs. I don't want to sacrifice that. But you seem to find a balance in doing both popular stuff and personal stuff. Is that something yeah. that you always thought about doing or what, what exactly was the rationale for you in sort of going I, between the two of them? I mean, I think I have, I have weird tastes and I have, um, I don't have like this thing that I'm here to say, you know, I don't like, there's some filmmakers that are here. You're not a because, message person. Yeah, or message person or a style person. Like I don't have this, this, you know, uh, this call to art. I have a call to experience and explore and have adventures and try Like I use, I use movies as a way that I get to travel around the world. I get to go to film festivals in Seattle and show up and meet people, and I get to uh, go overseas and film commercials. I just got back from Australia and India and wow, uh, awesome. South America, yeah. and like it, it's just a really amazing passport to the world. And not only that, I can like when I'm location scouting for a movie, I can knock on someone's door randomly and say, "Hey, can I look in your bedroom closet?" And they'll say, "Sure." <laughs> I've rarely been shot at. Um, and so it really just, for me, it, uh, different subject matters, different content um, are just new avenues to new things, to new stories, to new experiences. And that's one of the things I actually, I mean, I, I, I'm a big fan of, don't get me wrong, like, you know, Pineapple Express, The Sitter, all that sort of stuff I really do enjoy. But one of the things I enjoyed about Prince Avalanche is it was sort of a return to a smaller, more personal drama. And the first thing I want to talk about Prince Avalanche is <laughs> the advertising for it. Because when I first saw the trailer for it, it looks almost like a buddy comedy. And that's not really what the film is. And I'm glad that wasn't just what the film is. Because it's a really sort of interesting, I don't know, character study sounds like such a like blasé term at this point. But mm-hmm. it's sort of just this interesting story of these two guys. I mean, there's only two other real characters in the entire movie. It's just this guy and his, was it brother-in-law? Is, or, is he married? It's, I can't he's, remember. He, Paul Rudd is uh, is dating Emilia's Okay, so older I don't know, da- yeah. girlfriend-in-law yeah. or yeah, whatever girlfriend you want to call it. Um, but it's just really these two guys and sort of how they have to learn to connect with each mm-hmm. other. Uh, what was it about this film? I mean, this film was, from what I could tell, a remake of a Icelandic <laughs> film called Either Way. This yeah. seems like, how did that even get on your radar? Um it was funny. I, a friend of mine who had not seen either way was telling me about this. He was giving me a synopsis of that movie, and just him telling me that, I said, "I want to remake that." So that's so I I, I found a copy of the film and I watched it with the intention of remaking wow. it. Wow, um, sounds bizarre, but 
it seemed like a good idea at the time. I, I, uh, I mean, it, it's worked for it, other people. Christopher Nolan did it with Insomnia. So yeah, you know. no, I mean, and, and I think actually it, there's a, there's a strange stigma to remakes, which I don't quite understand. I mean, people. Uh, I mean, once you adapt a book, you're remaking someone's vision in a different mm. form. I don't know, and but yeah, that seemed appropriate. But people remaking a movie, uh, evolving a storyline, or changing a character's gender, or whatever, like feels like a betrayal of an yeah, original creation. I, mean, I don't you, really understand that. You, you make you make a good point. I think it's sort of like a convoluted sort of like checklist in my mind. It's sort of like, look, okay, like this one, you're crossing. Um, Continents, so it's a lot of people here are not even aware of this other movie, so it doesn't really feel like a remake, for instance. But like you know, when you're remaking, I don't know, like Transformers, like ten year or Batman, like they're going to remake now that Christopher Nolan's out, then it feels a little bit weird because it's just so recent. Right. It just feels like a cash grab so they can make it cheaply and stuff. And, and there's so much that that are remakes now. Right. I feel like if they were a little bit more choosy, people wouldn't mind. Right. Yeah, I don't know. Is not major audiences don't really seem to like the most unique oh, no, you're movies. You're absolutely right. Like, how many people want to see Holy Motors or This Must Be the Place last oh, no, year? You're like, absolutely right. Yeah, you know, people want Transformers. They want X, Y, and Z. I actually get. I, I like the Transformers movies. I've seen them all, but I get them confused. <laughs> like, I don't know. One, I, I I can tell the the first one's different from two and three, uh, but I get two and three really confused. Oh, uh, boy, I'm I'm an apologist, a Michael Bay apologist. So I'm I'm with you. I enjoy the Transformers. Oh, I've seen every Michael Bay movie. Yeah, he's incredible. And as I was mentioning before, I sort of got away from it. How much are you involved with the advertising of something like Prince Avalanche? Because it, it, as I said, it sort of felt like they're selling it as a buddy yeah. comedy. And it, like, do you worry about something like that and how they portray your movie? I, I, because I think expectations really manage people's responses to a movie. Absolutely. And I was very involved in in this campaign. For instance, I, I, I want I want people to go in there seeing. Uh, expecting to see a very likable, funny, charming movie, and then get an emotion, an honesty, a depth to these characters and these relationships. So that's, I don't know that it's as much a curveball because I think it is, it is, it is honestly advertising the movie that exists in there, but I think there's a lot more to it. Um, this feels like a way that I can, um, I can invite a large amount of people that wouldn't necessarily go to see a thought provoking movie, and I can invite them in in a welcoming way. Where they're not intimidated by it, and then they'll really like it. Yeah, so it's not like you're going to see Holy Motors or something like that. Right. It's it's a way to ease them into it. It, it eases them into it because I've been a, I've had experiences on on big movies where I have less control over the marketing and advertising, where they advertise exactly the wrong movie, and the wrong people go to see it, and then the wrong people don't like it. Of course they wouldn't because they're the wrong people, and then so word of mouth becomes very negative. And I think that can. That can certainly bite you in the ass because oh, totally, yeah. if you, I'd rather start small with the right people and develop the the, the authentic crowd, the appreciative crowd for a mm-hmm. movie. Um, but studios, a lot of time, there's so much pressure in the studio game to have that major opening weekend box office that they'd rather lie to you out front and trick you into buying a ticket so they can keep their jobs for the next week. You know, well, what I, I mean? mean, I think, it, I mean, not to get in too much to the like the mathematics of like movie releases, but I think you're absolutely, and that's why there's something like 60, 70 percent drop off. The second week, instead of like maintaining or right. growing, is because Very few the word of grow. math is so negative a lot of the time because it's not what they're expecting. Not what they expect. It's not, or it's not. You know, there's so many weird criteria. Like, would you tell your, would you recommend this movie to your friend? Is like the most important thing that a studio test screening can can educate you about. If you won't, it, it, like, and there's a lot of tricky movies to tell your friends about. Like, I wouldn't necessarily recommend my favorite movies to all my friends, no. um, but. That's you know that doesn't mean that I'm not going to tell a lot of people to go see this movie. You know, I mean, that's sort of something interesting to talk about. For you, you're somebody who seems like I mean, some of your stuff, you know, Pineapple Express, feels like it probably had a pretty solid built-in audience going to it beforehand. But it feels like you might be somebody whose films aren't necessarily easy to get through. You know. Um, test screenings it yeah. seems like a lot of people might be like i don't really understand it and the studio will be like all right we need you to rewrite it and make it a lot more funny and happy and blah blah blah, blah. is that something that you've sort of had to combat or do you feel like you've been successful or had good partnerships with studios because you have very interesting thought-provoking dramas but or some of your films have been sort of interesting unique films mm-hmm. and that might not be what a big audience right. necessarily is going to. And, and it jump depends into. on where you where you want the fight to be. Because it, 
I've had only every studio I've worked with says has no no one's told me I couldn't do anything or leave something in a cut. I've had only amazing experiences with studios and and I've been really lucky to work with fantastic That's studio great, heads. Yeah. Um, the trick becomes the relationship I have with the audience mm. is if I'll put something in a movie that I find hysterical and then I, you know you, you show it to an audience as a part of the, your studio process and they either don't get it or they don't like it or for one reason or another respond negatively to it, then you'd have to decide, do I want this movie to be less likable by the mainstream mm. um, because so to make it more likable to me or how valuable is the commercial success mm. of a movie like this? Um, you know, I, 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 it, Pineapple Express is a great example of something that I think found a successful balance, but there's things that I would see in a crowd and everybody would be dying laughing and I have no idea what they're laughing at. And there's other things that I think are the funniest thing in the movie and nobody laughs at it. So, but we got away with, it was a perfect balance of a little them, a little me, and then, and then everybody met in the middle in a strong mm -hmm. place to give it a lot of box office. Um, Your Highness's movie had to be absolutely mine. So the audience, I, th I think that I think that movie ultimately should have cost less money because the audience was more specific mm. for the fan base to achieve what it needed to achieve. Um, but I like that was one where I w I would um, I wouldn't give the audience necessarily their version. I gave them my version. I would imagine that's something that's sort of nice about you know working on a smaller film like Prince Avalanche is that you can have sort of more control. Yeah. Where I mean, when you get like a ton of stars involved, the bu budget starts skyrocketing. You know, there's certain well, expectations. It, it, I've always had control over it. I just never. Uh, I, I think there's just a lot more uh, responsibility, financial oh, responsibility yeah. in those. So if I want to, my, my, my the lessons I've learned is if I want to go make a really fucked up, strange little movie, <laughs> just make it not cost a lot of money, so that. Like a movie like Prince Avalanche will make everybody money and everybody will be fine no matter who yeah. goes to see it. You know, uh, he, you know, cousin Larry and his, you know, his three inbred nephews can go see this movie and will be successful. I mean, one of the things you talk about was that the trailer is sort of a way to draw people in and get them into something that might not be what exactly what they're expecting, but something they might enjoy. Is that sort of the rationale with casting Paul Rudd and Emil Hirsch too? Because they're sort of these very likable people, very funny, very personable people, but they all also are able to give you a certain depth with right. them when they act. Because they're very skilled actors. Yeah. And, 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 in, and something I'm really proud of in Prince Avalanche is that I think... Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if they'd agree with me, but I feel like the revelation of that movie is that Emil's really funny and Paul's a really skilled dramatic actor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, totally. And so we could kind of flip the perception of who the uh, where the co uh, comedic dynamic was, and that was really important to me to have have actors that were capable of depth and honesty uh, and comedy. That's great. Uh, in terms of Prince Avalanche, what is the sort of release strategy, and where can people find out more information about when it's coming to a theater near them? Uh, well, it's going to be released at least in New York and Los Angeles August 9th, and video on demand, and uh, be growing from there. I think maybe Sat uh, maybe Seattle on August 9th as well, early awesome. August. We'd uh, fight for it. I take it here. I promote it for good. sure. Good. We need we need all the, all the fans we can get because I think it's something that for for people that may like one side of my career or the other side and, and maybe be a little confused by my bipolar qualities as a filmmaker, I feel like this is one that invites everyone. Yeah, I totally could see that sort of in-between yeah. sort of place. Uh, in terms of you, what else do you have coming up that people might want to check out and where can people find more information about you? Do you have Twitter or any of that kind of I, stuff? I don't. I'm pretty technically... Um, <laughs> uh, Illiterate, but I, I have a. I, I spend most of my time making things, uh, and I don't. I don't mean that arrogant. Well, no, I'm, no, I'm very we proud appreciate of it. it. But no, like, totally. uh, and, and I don't really. Uh, I, I can talk about things once I've made. Like, I just finished a new movie um, called Joe. That will. I think I had seen that on your IMDb or something like that. I'm very excited about it. It's a very bleak, dark but beautiful. Um, it stars uh, stars Nicolas Cage. And wow. Ty Sheridan, the kid from Mud, if you've seen Mud. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's the two of those guys. Wow. And then the rest of the cast is like, we cast from like homeless shelters and day labor uh, centers and things wow. like that. So it's a very salty, um, very heartfelt story based on uh, a novel by Larry Brown, who was one of my favorite Southern writers. Uh, so that, that'll start uh, working the film festivals in the fall. Very cool. And I'm um, very excited about that. Stay tuned to your IMDb page and your theater trailers and whatnot near yeah. you to, for that one as well. Um, awesome, David. Well, I wish you luck with Prince Avalanche and Joe. And uh, check out more interviews at MacGuffin. Uh, MacGuffin.in, that is. And we'll see you next time. Good talking to you. Stop me. I'm a fire tonight. Magneto can't stop me. I'm a fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm a fire tonight. It's tight. Don't even try to buy the sound. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm a fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm a fire tonight. The Borg